nice intro. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm living in Los Angeles right now, and um, I just flew in last night at midnight and then was staying at my mom's in Virgin's, and um, I'm a little sleepy, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, all right, I'm going to start with a poem from my book, Field Music. which I did not bookmark. Uh, wow. Calvert. All of this damage is already done. The meadows inflamed and gone blonde with rash goldenrod. Nothing ever stays where it ought. Runoff dragged into the river by summer rains from shit-covered fields, my thickly perfumed Vermont. The morning glories creep up the shafts of the garden vegetables, their seductive curls choking out my small plot. Sometimes we can't see the dangers we feed, that we nurture, like the warbler who cares for the cowbird planted in her nest, a deep and doubling hunger fed as the nestlings starve in their crowded bowl. I know I'm not invited. I want to love something, not to open my mouth like the long, smooth flower of a ravenous weed. A series of losses. We rented the trailer on the goat farm. Dad worked there under the table. I didn't know what that meant, but he said, if mom starts to pry, just say I'm helping out. The farmer was an older lady, and dad said she wasn't well. I used to hear it as making ends meet, and I'd see a roast at the edge of everything. I love someone, and I visit him in Baltimore. His apartment is as cold as the farm was once it all started dying and being left around. Your accent comes out when you say what like that. I'm soft to him, like a child, when he teases me. I am a soft but reckless creature. Lives, whole and partial, have been left around. My father, now a crescent somewhere. I am ready to be devastated and I practice nightly, my head on this chest, soaking his t-shirt, bawling like the goats did in Cornwall, above the black fields. So those were from my book, Field Music. I'm gonna read a couple of um, more recent poems. This one is kind of long, it's called Trace. Um, does it feel kind of hissy or tinny, my voice, a little? If I like, it's not loud. You want, okay, um, I just am very sensitive to that tinny sound, so I'm trying to spare you, but if we're good, we're good. Okay. Trace. Based on the concentration of nerves throughout the body, you could say an octopus's mind is mostly in its arms in the way you might locate a person's mind, in her head or in her body, head included, and in the space around her body. For a week that summer, my body was a guest of a guest on a Mediterranean peninsula, watching from the rocks as the sky darkened over the water in the early afternoon, listening to the sound of children jumping from the low cliffs into the sea. I was convinced on one and then another occasion to jump from a high rock I may still be falling there, thinking, now look, that wasn't so bad. I'm thinking, I've made a mistake. The horizon line fixed, the body absorbed by the feeling of the whole, not quite keeping up with its parts. Still falling, thinking, this is how the air feels to a body that's been thrown, that has thrown itself from a cliff. This is how one lives with decisions. This is memory fragments of a drop. 
I'm not a diver, sky, or deep sea, but I've read a few things. Advice for divers. Know how the body responds to changes in pressure. Never hold your breath. The lungs contract on descent and expand on return. Ascend slowly and with care. Nitrogen in the blood becomes, nitrogen in the blood comes out of solution, becomes bubbles, becomes bends. The saddest songs are a little funny. Harry Nielsen burbling his lips and singing a plea. Won't you throw me down a lifeline? My father moving like a robot, pressing his finger on the trigger of a power drill to sound each mechanical movement of rigid hips and shoulders to my delight. We laughed till we were both in tears. Not one to move slowly, he came out of solution, became a part. Did we ascend? We moved around, we laughed and clowned. We didn't own the goat farm, we barely owned a thing. Watched the clerk at Ames take our items from the checkout counter and place them on a shelf below when my dad's card was declined. Shaving cream, toothpaste, one Ren and Stimpy birthday card, and one mermaid Barbie for my classmate's birthday party. Then went to the dollar store to find another present for this girl. I can't remember her now. Where we bought her a magnifying page for a dollar. The kind I'd seen used by old ladies to better see their crosswords and Bibles. But to a kid, that's enough. Or to me, it was. And I wrapped it and made a card. And that was it. Although I missed the Ren and Stimpy card that we had customized in the machine that scribbled the recipient's name in red ink. Jasmine or Sarah or Caitlin. And I hated the woman who had taken it when we were so ready to have it. I'd walked through the whole store holding it, preparing it for Jessica or Samantha or Ashley. Though I wouldn't know I hated that guiltless cashier till many years later in an oyster bar in Fells Point, when in the middle of what might have been a disinterested argument about money, I cried inconsolably and saw the hands of the Ames cashier so clear, her Kelly green apron, my eye line at her waist height, the green seams of the apron, the thick Ames font on the bag, happy birthday, Amy, or Courtney, or Tani, or Shayla. We didn't own the goat farm, just lived there, shoveled shit, fed the nannies and the kids. And for a while, Dad worked on the dairy farm down the street. I rode alongside him, long days in the Ford Ranger, the grain truck, the tractor with the baler, or the mower, or the tiller. All day, I read beside him, smell of hay and diesel and Marlboros, fields of rich clay, ticks in the tall grass, poison ivy at the edge of the woods, young forests where sheep pastures once lay. Before that, older woods, ice sheets clearing the landscape and retreating, pushing down on the crust to make an inland sea, the soil a consequence of accident, of force. A boy and his dog gazing down in the pit where the dog nearly fell. The boy calling down into it anxiously, hello? Echo? What could have gone wrong? What often does? In my great grandmother Gigi's hotel room, after Josh's wedding, my cousin Tyler playing Savage Garden on repeat on her Walkman and pining for a lost love saying, you'll understand someday, Alex while the adults drank light beer and vodka sodas and danced to Mustang Sally at the reception, and Gigi's thick, wrinkled fingers fussed over something, the way they always fussed over something, untangling the telephone cord or smoothing a blanket over a baby's back, or etching in crossword puzzle answers and erasing them, or noisily <coughs> opening a Royals caramel, or folding a tissue and tucking it in her shirt sleeve, or rummaging through drawers to find a misplaced paper TV remote, glasses, keys, address book, mirror, rosary. In that hotel room, amid Gigi's nervous fidgeting, Tyler draped over the sofa with her foot on the wall, hatching plans to sneak into the party, and I writing notes on the hotel notepad that bore indecipherable imprints from the previous page, marked by the previous guest, whose trace of having once been here pressed lightly on me like a thumb on a bruise of unknown origin. Without announcing itself, a door opened, the light changed, 
Gigi walked out and for a while was gone. How many rotations of truly madly deeply passed before we went to look for her and found her at the end of the hallway, pressing on the window, held there the way water holds a thing out of place, revealing the buoyancy of parents camp by the lake, a hospital stay, my mother, my brother, my sister, my angel, little Johnny, Hail Mary, sweet Annie, find the exit, our father, daddy's waiting, go home. And the density of Marriott, grandson, pay-per-view, ceremony, room key, address, next of kin, day, month, year, husband died, father died. And Tyler and I, never having seen this illness, knew only that Gigi had become dislodged, was floating somewhere in and outside of our lives as we tried to shepherd her back to our cell and keep her calm, Tyler nudging her with her palsied arm. And we waited for the bar to close and the dancing to stop and the others to drift up from the ground, from the ground floor and pour themselves drunk, damp, and vaguely angry down patterned halls and into their rooms. And just like that, Gigi had unsolved, come loose, and fallen out. Where did she go? Her mind moved into unfamiliar chambers, into memories of rooms that chafed against the present. Where are those rooms? Where have I been? Voices talking after a movie, the house lights coming on, cold wind moving over the lake, Philosophers puzzling over how to explain that the world shows up for us, that the lights are on, that there is something that it is like to be an octopus. My love's eyes darkening when he says, I'm not getting through to you. When he says, you always see me as the more powerful one. Where do I go then when I don't show up? When the lights turn off, when I list on the rough surface toward the wreckage, for the thought of the wreckage, the possibility of a crash. The, the sea doesn't choose whether to spare or wreck, says Vey. It is perfectly obedient to every external pressure. It is this perfect obedience that constitutes the sea. Straight face, pratfall, sight gag. I have tried to be good. Don't mind me. Just hold me in your long arms. Keep me in mind. I have tried to contain myself, suspended mid-fall or down at the bottom. I have tried not to slip through what I'm always slipping through, what it is like to be something, to have been something and change, incrementally, drastically, to have been seen, if only in passing or in profile, to have been a spot on the lens, to hear an echo and keep moving. Okay, I think I'm just going to read one more. Myth. Um, I grew up in Bridgens near Lake Champlain, so I write about lakes a lot. It's not always Lake Champlain, but that's the one I had in mind here. You could be one kind of thing and then another, the story goes. A body a houseplant, spare parts. Who said that? Marble faces that have seen the gods and their proclivities. Voices on the water. Patsy Cline on the radio singing, I fall to pieces. When I was young, I went to school by the lake. Sometimes in summer, I rode my bike out to the lake. At night, in the dark, we parked our cars by the lake and stepped carefully along the path in the dark by the lake. Why am I telling you this? Because it is full, not just of blue-green algae, invasive mussels, and the occasional unrecovered truck that fell through the ice, but of something awesome that can't be seen and that can't come out. Thank you.